Beside their ocean, millions of Californians bask and tan. They breathe the salt of the Pacific. It's a festival of sun and sea. But not all are masters of the surf. And how many ever wonder what other world lies beyond the shining wave? This realm has its own strange sky, mountains, and forests. And the amazing variety of life here is not only ruled by heat and cold, darkness and light, but by tides, currents, and storms. These govern the seasons of the sea. Summer, in a forest of seaweed. Giant kelps, firmly anchored and stretching up a hundred feet to find the Californian sun. The shores of California are rough-hewn by the Pacific. A strong current washes south along the coast. Its pull drags cold water up from the depths of the ocean, a rich, fertile mix that nourishes the giant forest riding the swell. The floating canopy of each kelp catches sunlight. It's the fastest growing plant in the world. At two feet a day, sunshine and seawater are building a living cathedral 16 fathoms tall. These are the largest seaweeds in the world. They are both food and home to an encyclopedia of marine animals. This fish is the most colorful. It's a Garibaldi. Its brilliance contrasts with other fish that are designed to look like the kelp itself. The giant kelpfish mimics the color, pattern, shape, even the movement of swaying blades. At the base of each blade, bladders filled with gas give buoyancy to the kelp. No seaweed needs roots, but without being anchored to the rocks by a holdfast, the whole plant and the animals it shelters would simply drift up and away. Sometimes, this forest is haunted by other giants from far away. The forest stands close to the path of a great migration. Only one or two grey whales cruising south push their 40-foot bulk through the giant kelp. On this annual voyage south, they are thought not to eat at all. But this one has scooped a mouthful of kelp, perhaps a giant snack of shellfish and whatever else was clinging to the weed. To the old whaling fleets, they were an easy offshore target, 
and were almost extinct by the 1920s. But for 40 years, they've enjoyed full protection and 18,000 pass by on their 5,000 mile round trip between the Bering Sea and their breeding grounds in the warm lagoons of Baja, California. The whale's southward passage is a token of winter's approach. But some animals make the kelp forest their home all the year round. The southern sea otter is an animal designed for life in the kelp. Once, they ranged all along the Pacific coast, but like the whales, were hunted almost to extinction, killed for their valued fur. Today, sea otters again cling to survival in the kelp forest. Sensing the approach of the first storm of winter, they can wrap up in the kelp with little fear of being swept into the surf, secure in the ultimate waterbed. The winter swell begins to grow, a rougher ride for the great blue heron. Even a hundred feet down, the new surge is felt. Oxygen, salts and minerals are stirred into a fertile mix by the energy of violent Pacific winds. Gigantic waves rip and tear the kelp. But the tatters are vital food for seabed animals where much of the edible debris will settle. Even in full rage, the winter surf remains a playground. Harbour seals romp in the foam and catch a wave when they can. And in California, even the last rays of winter sun can dry their coats. The dying sun and rising moon work their magic on the tides. On a cold current drawn from the depths of the sea comes a ghostly invasion. Opalescent squid begin to rocket out of the abyss in millions. Their multitude darkens the moon, shadowing the sandy plain beside the kelp forest. Until now, in the deep ocean, they've hovered by day on the edge of darkness, only rising at night to feed below the surface. This night, 
they are gathering for the final act of their lives, to breed. Propelled by bursts of seawater, the males jet after the females and grasp them in an embrace of blushing tentacles. The color warns other suitors to keep off. The male then uses a special arm to deposit sperm under a fold in the female's body, the mantle. The transfer complete, the male may seek another mate. The female produces an egg case about as long as her body, which she has packed with 200 eggs. She searches for a sandy place to secure her precious cargo and digs down several inches to bury the small anchor to which the egg case is tethered. Latecomers attach their egg cases to other clusters, creating extraordinary bouquets of new life. Deeply intent on this mission, the squid ignore all else. Males frantically mob the remaining virgin females, occasionally flushing with success. Unnoticed, death steals upon the frenzied squid. Pelagic stingrays stalk their victims, enfolding them with sinister wings, concealing capacious mouths. Caped marauders, the stingrays followed the squid here from the ocean deep and now feast upon them. Death faced the squid anyway. Every last ounce of strength has gone to secure their next generation. The midwinter dance is done. Only corpses remain for sand dabs to squabble over. All with a taste for squid, now scavenge one of nature's most remarkable phenomena. Decorator crabs wrestle with remnants, and there are scraps for anemones. Nothing goes to waste. But some eggs will inherit the sea. The squid have left their legacy for the future. The steady rhythm of sun, moon and earth brings spring to these waters stirring latent passions in all that are held in the ocean's embrace. yet old enough to produce young, these adolescent sea lions are awake to the pleasure of a spring encounter.
sea lions are so playful, it's hard for us to tell when they are doing things for pleasure or for a more practical reason. Just why it is carefully selecting and swallowing small stones, nobody knows. Perhaps they're for ballast, or to dislodge parasites from its insides. Or could it be simply just enjoying the taste? The sea lion's agility has purpose as well as grace. And there's nothing they enjoy more than showing off in company. By early June, the adults have gathered at the rookeries. The mature bull's profile is unmistakable. That domed forehead is his badge of breeding status. The females are giving birth on the beach and will not accept a bull until their pups are three weeks old. So not until then will the bulls lay claim to a breeding territory. But there are gentler pursuits on these warm spring days. Just beyond the sea lion's nursery, sea otters are warming themselves on the kelp forest canopy. They always look amusing. It's not scratching in irritation, but rubbing air into its fur as an insulating layer. They have been protected for 80 years, but once 10 times as many hunted for shellfish and sea urchins in the forest. And the forest needed their predation to keep a balance between the eaters and the eaten. Urchins do not have enough enemies here. One of the few in colder Californian waters is the wolf eel. But there are too few of them to keep urchins in check. The wolf eel has a face suitable for crushing urchins. Massive jaws and grinding teeth undeterred by the urchins' hard spines. In the warmer waters of California, where battalions of sea otters are now reduced in number, there is no stopping the relentless march of the urchins. Their ranks are always growing. 300 urchins to the square yard is not unusual, and their slow, hungry advance destroys everything in their path. Such an army can destroy a kelp forest. Then it must move on in search of more kelp. But these empty wastes are not without dangers for the invaders. White urchins, small but deadly. They have little difficulty overwhelming their large, seemingly well-armored cousins. Condense the work of several hours into a few seconds, and the attack is seen to be violent and deadly.
What normally seems a quiet sand flat is really a theater of life and death encounters. Bat stars eat urchins, but there is a good deal of body language before the meal. They have to overturn the urchins to avoid the spines. Now the white urchins clean up. Watched at this speed, bat stars have a surprisingly active social life. This hurly-burly of meeting and greeting seems to vanish the moment the scene is viewed normally. Compared with the kelp forest, there seems little here. But there is enough potential prey around to keep this swell shark content and fed. It hunts at night by ambush, and for its own safety, it can wedge its body in a rock crevice by swelling up, hence the name. This is a female swell shark and she's preparing to lay one of the few eggs she will produce this year. As a night hunter, she needs and has exceptional eyesight. But she is also acutely sensitive to the weak electric fields produced by the muscles of prey hiding in the dark. And there is the egg capsule, a leathery purse looking rather like a piece of drift kelp. A useful disguise because the mother now abandons it. Inside, the young shark will take 10 months to develop. From now on, without any motherly care, it must take its chance alone. It can swim in its private sea months before release. Almost a year later, when it has outgrown the confines of the capsule and used up the egg yolk, an enzyme secreted by the youngster dissolves the weld which seals the two halves of the egg case, and a shark is born. Already, it is too big for some that might fancy eating it. Another piece of kelp debris? No, another kind of mermaid's purse. From this one, a horn shark comes boldly forth. A six-inch miniature of the four-foot adult it should become, it has all the appeal of a perfect working model. Its nursery has been the kelp forest. But the world it's designed for is this sandy plain reaching westward to the edge of the continental shelf. It's an undersea desert, deceptively empty. With a gulp and a gasp, a perfectly camouflaged angel shark sucks in the tiny horn shark only to spit it out as an unpalatable morsel. True to its name, 
The horn shark is armed with a sharp horn or spine on its back at the base of a fin. It is rammed into the roof of the attacker's mouth. Its cover blown, the angel shark is forced to move on. Flattened like a ray, it will vanish into the sand again and will sense its prey by detecting the tiny electric signals from a potential victim's flexing muscles. Within these egg cases, hundreds of tiny squid have hatched. A contrast with the one or two eggs produced by sharks. For two weeks, they are relatively safe inside the case, but then they must venture out unprotected in their millions. The merest fraction of these hordes that live through the next year will return to breed. But now they join the living stream of microscopic plankton flowing out of the kelp forest, on which many mouths are quick to feed, including one of nightmare size. The basking shark sweeps majestically through the fog of tiny animals and plants. To catch such fine plankton, its gills are expanded into a giant sieve, filtering a thousand tons of water an hour. Small schools of these 30-foot gentle giants follow the cold and fertile currents welling up from the deep Pacific Ocean. Sometimes these and other currents kidnap stranger animals from little-known parts of the sea. A gigantic pelagic jellyfish floats out of the blue. It's a kind not known before and has extravagantly frilled oral arms trailing from around its mouth to some 20 feet away. A squadron of these inner spaceships has been carried off course by an onshore current. Even the huge pulsating bell three feet across that is the Medusa's source of power cannot fight the current. Sadly, shipwreck is inevitable for these magnificent vessels and for the complement of creatures sailing with them. This young slender crab is thought to be feeding on plankton caught in the mucus coating of the arm. It's a good hiding place, well protected by the surrounding stinging cells. But just what this bizarre dance is all about remains a mystery. 
Is the crab enjoying a significant partnership, or is it just an accidental tourist caught up in the impending disaster? Under the veil of slim, deadly tentacles, juvenile jackfish are at home, managing to find some dubious safety. They are not wholly immune to the stings, but they do steal a meal or two and are out of reach of many predators. What the jellyfish gets out of the arrangement isn't known, but it may be the removal of parasites. For the residents of the nearby kelp forest, the newcomers ballooning into their world demand investigation. Kelpfish and Garibaldis risk the discomfort of the jellyfish's stinging cells. Each cell contains a harpoon for catching microscopic prey. The Garibaldis seem to relish the jellyfish nonetheless. The Garibaldis are used to various local relatives of this stranger from the ocean. A sea anemone is a jellyfish upside down and anchored to a rock. In this case, the body is in a tube. The tentacles again are richly armored with stinging cells. Deadly encounters with tiny animals cause the tentacles to contract as prey is drawn down to the mouth in their midst. A flower of the sea whose stings capture food and repel attack. But no defense is perfect. the rainbow nudibranch drops in for a meal. It's a sea slug with a taste for tube anemones. There's no difficulty in climbing the anemone's tube. The problem is getting hold of the anemone. Who has hold of whom? Well, the anemone is short of a few tentacles, and the nudibranch has those tentacles inside it. Remarkably, the stinging cells from the anemone are not digested, but find their way to the sea slug's own tentacles, where they serve as necessary protection for the new conspicuous owner. The brilliant colors of most sea slugs advertise their second-hand stinging power. So, few animals eat sea slugs. But there is a relative in the kelp forest with an insatiable appetite for them. It's a sea hare called Navanax. It tracks its quarry down by following the slime trail of the sea slug.
The sea slug and its hand-me-down stinging cells end here, digested inside Navanax. Another stealthy killer lurks in a sea cave. The moray eel. Its sense of smell is acute, especially for octopus. Six feet of eel ties a deadly knot, and the octopus discharges a cloud of ink. The eel's needle-sharp teeth in steely jaws tear off an arm. But loss of a limb is not fatal for an octopus, and the moray has to be satisfied for the moment. But the octopus's problems are not over yet. A sharp-eyed harbor seal has noticed the commotion. The best the octopus can do is change color and texture and mimic the rocks. The harbor seal returns to the shelter of the kelp forest. In these warm, calm days of summer, coastal waters have the clarity of crystal. The kelp fish now has summer dress that matches the kelp. As well as the hundred feet of each kelp plant that rise to the top of this amber forest, there is another hundred feet on the surface. It can almost be seen growing. It is a living, expanding bed for a harbor seal. The spread of the giant kelp along the Californian coast is a summer spectacle. But its wonder and value can only be fully understood by diving under that canopy into the great fish nursery that harbor seals and others appreciate. The distinctive Garibaldis breed in summer. It's his job to grow red algae, a clump on the rock that will become his nest. Like any conscientious gardener, he must remove the pests. He won't harm the urchin. That's never been his role in the system. But the urchin will certainly eat his little garden, so it's an endless task. There's weeding to do as well. Only one kind of red algae will do. Satisfied with his efforts, he's ready to solicit for a mate.
He has a female in view. He is very persistent. She is used to this and has entered many nests, but only laid eggs in a few. This nest seems satisfactory. She really prefers large nests with some eggs already laid, but she begins to lay anyway. Once the last egg is laid, he quickly escorts her away. She might eat some eggs. He then fertilizes the clutch. They'll take two to three weeks to develop. He uses his mouth to aerate the eggs and clean them. He'll take good care of the nest and clutch defending it against senorita fish and other predators. The cabazon is another father that guards his developing brood of eggs. Again, he needs to be vigilant. At this season, there are many anxious parents watching for thieves. The young have started to hatch. As with the squid, survival of the cabazon depends on the few hatchlings that evade capture. The rest feed other mouths in these fish-rich waters. The forest fills with emerging young. Only a few young Garibaldi make it to this size. And the spiky forest of an urchin makes it an excellent hiding place. They soon dart between the spines when a school of jack mackerel passes by. The schools sweep in from the open sea, drawn by the abundance of food. The foundation of all this life can be traced to the giant kelp. As the huge seaweeds fragment, their debris feeds the minute plankton of the sea. And on that near invisible drifting life feed hordes of shrimp-like krill, themselves in turn food for ocean animals large and small. herd the krill into a ball that is easier to feed on. Individual krill can be plucked from the edge of the whirling mass.
blue shark, 12 feet of elegance and power. Now it's the turn of the anchovies to be rounded up. Blue sharks are skilled at the technique. The school moves as one animal. Each individual darts for safety at the center of the mass. At this time, the sharks are distracted by the ball of krill still spinning from the anchovies attack. Until now, it was a mystery how predatory blue sharks could feed on such tiny animals. And here is the answer. It's a strange liaison between anchovy, shark, and krill. Unmolested krill spread out. Only a rosy haze betrays their presence in millions. But there are animals that can comb this diffuse feast from the sea. One is the largest in the world, the blue whale. At 100 feet in length, the blue whale is perhaps the largest animal that has ever lived. Certainly greater than any known dinosaur. As heavy as 24 elephants, it exists only on krill. With a sideways rush, it opens its colossal mouth, engulfing an entire school. Its throat balloons, swollen with a torrent of the living sea. Its 20-foot-long tongue will squeeze the water out through its baleen, a gigantic sieve which retains krill by the ton. The blue whale continues its journey through the ocean, following the seasons of the sea. The chill of winter has banished the sun-loving tourists. 